Okay, if we can uh, sit up. Just a couple of notices before we uh, let the kids out and uh, Stu comes and shares with us. Um, this evening we've got Jay with us who's going to share his testimony, very powerful testimony. Uh, I'm expecting a full house, so if one or two of us could perhaps park on Queen Vic, that would be good. And um, if you can normally come on the two minutes to two, six buzz, uh, if you can get here at quarter two, that'd be really good. Just, you know, get on the early buzz, you know, get here sooner rather than later. There's nothing worse than new people coming into a half-empty church. And so um, if you want a three-line whip, you've just got one, please be here early tonight. Um, that's, that's okay. Can I just give you a, a very, very prior notice? On May the 17th, we have another baptismal service here. If you haven't been baptised and you want to be, please see me. We've got two candidates from Pastor Leonard's church to Black Church. That's where Steve Goodall is this morning. Uh, they start at half ten, and he'll probably be home about four o'clock. So um, they pray for an hour before the service starts, and so you can imagine. But they're going to be with us, so that's going to be an interesting morning, isn't it? Also, our deaf community are going to be with us. Isn't that going to be one amazing morning? So you don't want to miss that. Put it in your diary, the 17th of May. But if you want to be baptised, will you come and see me? Uh, I'm believing that by that time, that even from this evening, we might have people that come to faith that will follow Jesus through the waters of baptism. It's not some merit badge for long service, you know. In the New Testament, they believed and were baptized virtually right away because of what was happening in the Roman Empire. They would have been dead if they hadn't have followed Jesus in that way quite quickly. And so, you know, we want to encourage people to take many steps of faith towards Jesus and really become disciples. So the 17th of May, if you can put that one in your diary. Okay. Um, right, kids, you can go. That'll be good. They're off. And they're off. Didn't take him long, and uh, please welcome our good friend Stu, and deputy leader of the council. Would you pr would you would you would you pray for him? And uh, during this time, he's camp he's campaigning. And um, you know what I've, we, I've often said I've said to him personally, you can't get a cigarette paper between the main parties, really ideologically. In many ways, there's a lot of middle ground. But what I will say is this: it's good when righteous people are in positions of authority. So would you vote? It's a disgrace if you don't, and that's another three line whip from me. Do not grumble. Do not grumble about the state of this nation and sit at home and do not vote. That is a disgrace. You have a vote, vote, pray and go and vote and at least make a difference and ask God who to vote for. And let's see this nation turned around again. God bless you. Thanks, Jim. Oh, what a build up, yeah. <laughs> Follow that. Well, I can promise you one thing this morning there'll be no politics at all, so you can. Uh, Rest assured of that. Uh, let's just have a quick word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to share with your people. Lord, with, Lord in, in, in my church, Lord, this morning. Father, I just pray that you will anoint your words. Lord, anything that is not from you, Lord, I pray, will just fall away. And not be remembered, Lord, or acted on in any way at all. Lord, we just want to know the truth. We want to live the truth in our lives. So, Father, I just pray now that you will anoint your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, I've got a, what I hope, anyway, is a, a, a word of encouragement for you this morning. Uh, I, uh, I spent two weeks studying um, uh, Saul and David with, with the idea that's what I talk about, and then God said, oh, no, you're not going to be meant talking about that at all. So all that went sort of by the by. Um, and sort of got abandoned, and what I, uh, what I felt was that God wanted to share, wanted me to share something that was really personal to me. Uh, and you know, I, I think I've said this before when it comes to preaching. For me, you know, I always feel it's more a case of, as Steve said, sharing. You know, this is where I am. Where are you? Try, really trying to sort of share some encouragement from uh, from where I am and where and what I've sort of found. Uh, so, with that in mind, um, the title, if, can you just put the title up? Yeah. I didn't, it's one of those I really didn't know how to title it, but uh, I settled on uh, sort of purpose, uh, our purpose in God. And for me, I think what, it, I sort of want to focus really on sort of the last sort of 12 to 18 months where I uh, felt a real stirring, really, uh, within me. Um, sort of, a, I think God, when He wants to move us on, if we don't, uh, if we if we don't, then He'll sort of, 
there'll, there'll come a, a period of feeling unsettled, really, and uh, s very much so in my work situation. Um, I felt that I was in a very comfortable place, um, a very uh, safe environment, but I, I, deep down I had a real sense that I wasn't where I should be. Uh, and, and I wasn't being used in the way I felt God wanted me to work. But I didn't act on that, uh, sort of carried on really. Um, but then there were some difficulties at work, which I won't go into this morning. But uh, it, was, it soon became sort of very clear to me that God wanted a change of direction uh, in my life. Um, and of course, part of that, uh, very much from a family, from the family situation, Ruth obviously sort of went through a lot of this with me. Uh, I decided to leave the job that I'd had for nine years. That was working for Ian Austin, as many of you know. Uh, and I went to uh, work at Dudley College, go back into sort of education, which I'd come out of in the n sort of the prior nine years. Uh, and that has been a, a journey I in itself, really, because um, the sort of the job I went into, sort of. Um, as, as sort of well has gone now. Uh, you, you might have seen an Express and Star that has been uh, 30 or so redundancies at the college. That, that wasn't. None of those were the jobs that I was uh, was do, was doing strictly because I wasn't actually a sort of a permanent lecturer. It was sort of a, a variable hours. I think some people. The political term being bandied around, of course, is zero hours contracts. But uh, <laughs> so that we but we took that step of faith and. Um, uh, with the, I suppose in a sense there was that backup plan, if you like, that the, the stuff I do with the council uh, was clearly um, growing and developing and God was massively blessing me there as, and I've shared some of that with you uh, uh, along the way. Uh, but I think for me it was, uh, it was more a case of, I didn't feel as if there was an alignment through my life, if I can put it like that. There was, not that it wasn't authentic, but I felt that there was, it was disjointed. Um, so I took this, we took this step of faith and uh, going back and into, into education. And that's been difficult in many ways, because as I say, the job I sort of went into, the funding, <laughs> ironically got pulled by the government, but we won't go into that. Uh, but God has been incredibly gracious. Uh, I'm currently teaching A-level religious studies at the college, which was amazing how that came about. Uh, and I'm finding that an incredible challenge, but at the same time, uh, a real sense that I'm in the right place. It's interesting, I'll share the course with another guy who's an atheist, so we've got a Christian and atheist teaching A-level religious studies, and the kids have spotted it. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't you know, preach to them, obviously, but you know, we look at the Bible together, and that's in itself an incredible blessing. But they've sussed it out. They can tell the difference. Because one of the girls said to me, she could see the difference between me and, uh, and, and Nigel. So that has been an interesting challenge. But through all of this, really, it's been a, a sense of rediscovering what my purpose is. Uh, and I think for all of us, we can lose that from time to time uh, and uh, that sense of what God wants us to do can start to become obscured I think a little bit. Uh, so three things I sort of want to bring with you, bring to you this morning uh, that I've sort of been part of this journey and three things that I've, I've sort of feel that I've learned. You should put those up Josh, the, um, the last one, yeah. Okay, so, what, so the three things I want to run through this morning are presence, not absence, abundance, not scarcity, and love, not fear. Uh, and these are sort of three hangers, if you like, of, uh, which have sort of marked out the journey over the last 18 months or so. Uh, and what I, felt, what I felt during this period more than, than anything is that I think what can happen to all of us in our sort of Christian life is that there, there can be a real sense of a focus on our failings rather than uh, our gifts, if you like. Uh, and and uh, as part of that, we, if we're not careful, we can end up settling for less in our lives. Uh, our expect expectations of God can start to slip. 
And if we're not careful, we start to live in a spirit of fear rather than a spirit of love uh, and a spirit of hope. And I really believe, and I think especially for us this morning and for some of us here, that that is so not God's plan for our lives. Uh, God's, you know, God's plan is all about abundance, love, integrity, authenticity, truth. And these are the natural, this is the natural way of things, but somehow along, somewhere along the way, I think we've lost sight of that. Uh, and we need to really accept the fact that this isn't how it should be. And, and I, I really believe for all of us that we need to focus on less on our weaknesses and on the things that maybe we feel we don't have but more on what our strengths are. Uh, and I, I felt a real sense what God was saying to me, you know, stop battling, stop, you know, stop uh, trying to fight your way through things. Uh, you know, that, that came through to me sort of very clearly. And that sort of brings me on really to sort of, if we can just go on one, Josh, please. Uh, to presence, not absence. Now, this, this is an interesting one because a bit of this came from what I was doing as part of the, the class that I'm teaching, we were looking at uh, you know, evil in the world and where evil came from. It's a part of the, the syllabus. And uh, uh, a great Christian thinker, some of you may not have read or know about St. Augustine, uh, said that evil in the world uh, was more about an absence of good rather than a presence of evil, um, which I think is an interesting thought in itself. Uh, but effectively, what it was saying is where there's a vacuum, something will fill it. Uh, and if it's not good, then it'll be, it, it, it'll be the opposite to that. So the presence of good then will stop uh, evil. And this reminded me of this passage. If you could just put the passage up. Many of you will know this passage. And it, I've got to be honest, it's always been one I've struggled with really. But I've seen a new... Uh, I've got something new from it in recent times. Matthew 12, 43 to 45, and, it's, and it says this. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. And I, I felt very clearly what God was saying um, in this is that peace, if you like, uh, is not about the absence, but it's about presence. If there's not something there, then we'll, we will struggle. It's about uh, something that's got to be put in. Uh, clearly in that uh, passage, uh, Jesus is saying that it's no good clearing yourself out of all those things that are holding you back, all those problems that you face. If you don't replace it with, with something else, you're just going to end up worse than you were before. So this phrase just kept, has, has been with me really for a long time now. It's about presence, not absence. We've got to, uh, we've got to have God's presence in whatever way, shape or form, uh, we can meet with him to, that's got to fill that vacuum if not we're going to it's going to be it's going to be a struggle uh, it's not about managing our behavior uh, and if we're not careful we can always be working on the absence we can always be working on getting rid of, rid of things that we see as blocking our way uh, to God or to peace you know that focus is always on something being there that we need to get rid of if I could only you know, have this or have that or get rid of this, then everything will be fine. And you can find yourself, if you're not careful, in a bit of a cycle of failure where you're working hard to get rid of stuff in your life, things that you feel hold you back. But if we're not putting anything in there, if God's not going into that space, then we're going to find ourselves more often than not disappointed. And worse than that, our expectations of God can, can start to slip because the emphasis and I feel this really strongly, we can fo our focus can be so much on the negative rather than on, on the positive stuff that God's got for us and God wants us to do. It's always about, uh, you know, our, difficult our difficulties will always be around us. There'll always be things we have to deal with. But, you know, and it was said this morning, I think Steve said it early on, about the presence of God. It really is about presence. 
It's not about absence, it's about uh, presence. And as part of that, Josh, if you can, uh, these are very small, aren't they? I've just realized this, I'll have to read these out. Uh, you know, and we, we said, it's been a theme really the last few weeks, uh, I think within the church, that, you know, and this is from Luke seventeen twenty one. behold, the kingdom of God is within you. That sense that of God within us, I think we need to acknowledge. It's not external to us. God is, you know, within each one of us, that love him, that have accepted him, God is within us. Uh, and we can do incredible things with, with if we just only acknowledge that. Uh, Josh, if you could put the next one up. Yeah, and, and again, I've sort of, again, part of the, the A-level course, really, we were looking at the creation story. And I think I discovered for the first time this passage, uh, Genesis 1, 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. You know, it's an incredible thing that we are made in the image of God. Uh, and again, something that we forget, that that divine spark of God is, is within each one of us. Uh, how incredible that is. Uh, you know, and I think again that's something we need to acknowledge. If we can just put the next one on. Yeah, I I Ephesians. Uh, again, the what I'm trying to get over here is the is is how is our likeness to God. Is how God has created us. And Ephesians two ten said, "For we are created, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared us in advance for us to do." Again, you know, the sense that. God has put us together, you know, your talents, your gifts, your strengths, all those things that you've got. If we're continually focusing on what's absent and not what we've got, not what's within us, uh, God has given us all of these things and we need to develop those uh, talents. 2 Timothy says, doesn't it, fan into flame the gift of God uh, which is within you. And again, it's focusing on our strengths, not on our weaknesses. I think we really need to sort of latch on to that. Uh, I think that's really important. What's the next one, Josh? Uh, and again, really, for just to e re-emphasize the point uh, of, you know, how fearfully, wonderfully made we are and how, mu how much God has given us. Genesis 11, 5 to 6, talking about the Tower of Babel. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that men were building. The Lord said, if as one people speak in the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. You know, that's people acting without God. You know, that's what mankind can do without God. You know, incredible things. We've seen it, haven't we? But just think what we can do if we acknowledge him in our lives, the gifts that God has given, we uh, can do incredible things. It's about the presence of God not the absence, not focusing on the things we need to get rid of or the things that hold us back. Yes, we need to deal with those, but we'll deal with those much better when we've got God's presence within us and when God uh, is within each one of us. So, uh, abundance, not scarcity. Uh, you know, it's the great lie, I think, uh, that life's all about shortage. I, I really do. I think uh, it's, the, it's one of the great lies that we get sold through the media, through uh, uh, TV, in, in everything really. You know, we get told that there's, uh, there's a shortage of money, shortage of jobs. When we're single, we, we, we get told there's a shortage of wives and husbands. Uh, you know, all these things, it's all about shortage, that there's, there's a lack, you know, that there is a lack. Uh, but, you know, it's not God's way at all. It's not God's way. God's way is about abundance. It's about abundance, not scarcity. Uh, if you can just put the first reading that you won't be able to read. Matthew, uh, John 10, of course, the obvious reading really here. But I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows, uh, which is added on um, from the Amplified Bible. But I think really sort of... Um, expressing that you know that an abundant life you know a cup that overflows what does that mean how do we measure that uh you know for me i think one of the things i had to acknowledge really over the last sort of 18 months was life was becoming a series of battles if i can just win that battle if i can just win the next battle if i can just get over that if i can just achieve this and it was just a series of of hurdles really and it wasn't really getting me anywhere in all truth 
you know, they might, to the outside, to the outside eye, it might look that way, you know. Ah, it's all, it's all sort of going well. But in reality, you know, sort of fighting all these little battles is absolutely exhausting stuff, you know. It, it, it drains us of, 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 of sort of the naturalness uh, that God wants to put into, into our lives. Uh, one of my favourite films going back years, and if you any, any ever saw it, it's probably 30 years old now, it was a film called City Slickers. I don't know if anybody ever saw that film. But it's a really interesting film. There's a lot of great sort of p quite poignant lines in it. And in one scene, uh, Billy Crystal is trying to lasso, uh, like, you know, sort of, a, it's like a cow, but it's not, it's not a real one. It's sort of, you know, an imitation one. He can't do it. And the, the guy he's with keeps saying, it's getting embarrassing now. You can't, you know, you've been doing this all day. You can't, you can't, you can't do this. And uh, he says, oh, it's okay. I'm doing my best. It's, you know, it's not a competition. And his mate says, of course it's a competition. Everything's a competition. Life's a competition, you know. And, uh, and of course, that's how we're taught to believe that life is. We compete for jobs. We compete, uh, you know, for our slice of the cake, if you like. Uh, but of course, it's not, it's not God's way. It's not the Christian way. Our outlook has to be different to that. Uh, if we can, Josh, you can just put the next one on. Uh, this has been a reading, really, that I've sort of, has been with me for the last 12 months or so, and I just feel it's, it's so powerful. And I'm going to read the amplified version of it. Uh, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what is good and acceptable and, perf and, and the perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and, ac and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. You know, and I <laughs> that mindset, what I was talking about before about absence, not presence, uh, sorry, presence, not absence. The, the two things here really sort of go together for me. It's sort of, it's, it's, it, it's about that getting that mindset, you know, uh, looking at things differently to how the world does. You know, it's not about a comparison between us and someone else. It's about uh, us being our best selves that we can be, that God has made us to be, you know. But again, coming back to what those gifts that God has given you, those strengths that He has given you, you know, what are we doing with those? You know, what you know, what are we doing with them? Are we, or is our focus continually on the thing that's missing? What have we not got? You know, and I think that's where we're being deceived. I think we've got to, we've got to focus on what we have got and make the most of that. I, I sort of as part of this over the last. 18 months or so, I've been reading a book by a guy called Nick Williams. Now, I'll confess right now that this guy isn't a Christian. Uh, uh, well, yeah, not that I'm aware of anyway. But the, it's, and the, the book's about the work you were born to do. But it, it really is a good book. It's, it's got, there's, there's so much in it. And, but as I was reading it, I thought, this is, this guy's took the Christian message. <laughs> And made made a book out of it without being directly. I mean, he does quote the Bible in it, but he, he doesn't you know acknowledge things that we would acknowledge. But he was talking about the truths uh, about what we you know what we what we are, what we could be, what we should be, and he, he he'd sort of he'd taken the uh, and I was able to look at it without the religious blinkers, if you like. But I wasn't sort of continually looking at oh you know what do I need to stop? What what, what have I got to bring in? And all of a sudden, I had an incredible, um, I, I saw the Christian message f afresh for the first time, uh, you know, in years. And, and one, of the, one of his points, which I thought fits exactly right, but if you don't think so, obviously, set it aside. He said that there's only two sponsoring thoughts that we have for everything we do. And he said it's love and fear. You know, we either do things driven by love or we do things driven by fear. What you know? What's driving us? Why are we uh, doing? And, and you can do religious, you can do church things through fear. Make no bones about that. What will they think? Or you know, uh, even guilt, if you like. You know, maybe thinking God will somehow not be happy with us if we don't do X, Y, or Z. Uh, and he, he, 
he said uh, that fear, I think this is almost biblical really, but he focused on a lot of the stuff that we talk about. He said that fear focuses on survival, guilt, doubt, blame, battles, criticism, conflict, struggle, striving, cynicism, living too much in the past, living too much in the future, scarcity, control, defensiveness, and demanding that our needs o- are always met. You know, these are what, this is what being driven by fear. Now, I looked at that list and it, I, I didn't come out of that too well, I'll be honest, you know. And, and it just made me think how much of what I do and how I live is driven by fear. Uh, uh, and of course, we know with God it's different. That's not, that's not God's way. What, uh, there's no lack of anything at all. Now, the, the obvious reading again here is 1 Corinthians 13, the, uh, the passage that usually gets read, uh, read at weddings. Uh, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts always hopes, always perseveres. You know, that is God's way. That's the way of love. Those are the sponsoring thoughts, if you like, that we should have. Uh, And if there's one of the main things I want you to sort of think about really today is that I think with God, there's no lack of anything. And again, it comes back to this abundance, not scarcity. Uh, if there is lack in our lives, it's generally a lack of will, lack of purpose, lack of courage, uh, lack of inspiration, or just a lack that we fail to fully understand who we are in God, how much he loves us, how much he's given us, uh, how much he wants to be with us. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm actually going to uh, disagree with something my wife said uh, earlier on at the end of, end of a prayer, which I know is a bit controversial. But I thought it was quite interesting. It's our 12 year wedding anniversary today as well, so I'm probably in, in, invited something there. But Ruth said it's uh, about doing more. I want to do more. And you know, I don't think that's the case. I don't think it's about doing more. I think God's looking at us and saying uh, he, wants us to, he wants us to be who we are in him, to be more, you know, not doing more. And uh, I've read a, a little saying recently and again dismiss this if you like he's a bit corny but i think it's interesting it says we're called human beings for a reason we're not human doings we're human beings and we need to be you know we need to be in god you know and have that comfort have that relationship that intimacy it's not i don't think god looks at any one of us and thinks i wish they did more but i bet he looks at most of us and says i wish they spent more time with me i wish we had a better level of I wish they would let me in. You know, I think that's what he would say too. He would certainly say that to me. It wouldn't be about, I've tried the doing more. I've tried it. You can race around all day long doing as much and you'll keep going, chasing your tail. But it's about being, and I really believe that to be true for us this morning. Last one then, Josh, please. And again. There we go. Love, not fear. And I think, uh, sort of wrapping things up really, for me, this is the one I'm working through. Uh, this is a, it's a work in progress situation. Um, you know, going back to that s- two sponsored thoughts, love and fear, being, you know, being driven by love and not being driven by fear, I think is a massive challenge. Uh, and th- one of the readings I've got a lot from is 1 John 4. If you could just put that up and I'll read it out. Uh, there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out all fear. But again, you know, what, when you talk about love, it's such a word that covers so much. What, you know, what are we really talking about? And of course, I- I further on in that passage, the next, you can just put the next one up, Josh. Uh, yeah, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So we're ta- again, we're talking about when God is love. Again, it's about presence. It's not about absence. It's about the fact that God is love. 
So, uh, what do we choose, ultimately? Uh, if all behavior is, all is either loving or not loving, if fear focuses on the external things, survival, scarcity, failure, what do we choose to do? And you know, another phrase that I've got here, and again, dismiss it if you want, but I think it's an interesting one, is it says, before we can be fully divine, we have to be fully human. And you know, I think what that means to me as a Christian is that we have to accept ourselves for our faults, for our failings, for the things we, can, we don't ever seem to get right. Uh, you know, because God's not after that from, it, from, from us. It's not what he, he doesn't want us that way. He, wants, he created us as we are. He wants to work on us. He wants to change us. But that's got to come through his presence. It can't be about absence. It can't be focusing on our weaknesses and not our strengths. It's our gifts, not our failings. And, you know, ultimately, uh, and I think this is a really profound thing, uh, the last human freedom is to choose our attitude. There's some things we can't choose, aren't there? A lot of things can happen to us, you know, who knows what the future holds. But in any situation, whatever we face, we can choose our attitude towards it. You know, and uh, and we can choose to love, can't we? Each other. You know, we can we we can choose to do that. That's a choice we have, and that's through. We, and we can and and we need to do that through God, and because God is love, and that's a choice we need to make. But again, that's something we need to commit to. Uh, our commitment to our calling, whatever that may be. I'm, I'm not here to tell you all the answers to all of that. This is very much just a sort of some thoughts, really. But I don't believe that's ever a single decision. I think that's a commitment we have to make each day, that we have to commit to, to God's presence and to finding out what God, uh, not, not just what God wants from us, but just spending time with God so we have an understanding, a naturalness, that alignment that I was talking about at the beginning, that uh, authenticity, you know, is a word that I, I really feel strongly about. I don't believe there should be uh, a dividing line between the sacred and the secular in our lives. Not that we should be, you know, uh, walking around... Uh, sort of preaching all day long. I think it's much more natural than that. I think, you know, we tune into God. We, a lot of these things will become natural to us. As I say, it's not about us doing more. It's about being more, and we, and, we, and we can be more when we acknowledge God in our lives. And when we can, each day, we can find the time. And I think that is important. That's something I'm, again, still working on. Finding that inspiration every day to get to allow, allow God to be in there so as this stuff flows naturally from me and it's not a case of I'll be a Christian at this minute or I'll share this the other but it's there and it's people can see it and it's there all the time and that's not always easy uh, certainly in the council house that can be uh, quite difficult and I think just wrapping things up you know I don't again the world's attitude is very much about winning isn't it are we winning are we losing you know it's football this afternoon big game in, for, for me anyway and uh, you know we really want to win because that's the way of things in the world you want to win you don't want to lose but I think in life that's not what God's looking for from us whether we win whether we lose I don't think it's about any of that I think it's about his presence allowing his presence not worrying about the things that we can't control not worrying about the times we failed or that vicious circle of disappointment and lower expectations it's about just letting God in, letting God into our lives, letting, make, allowing space for him to be present, uh, finding the inspiration to be the person we were meant to be, we were called to be, that we are. It's just a case of allowing it to flow through us. And I think then, ultimately, we will find our purpose. Um, it is about presence, not absence. In God's world, it's about abundance. It's not about scarcity. Don't let anyone scare you into thinking that there's a shortage of anything. There really isn't. It's all there, and God wants us to have it. And finally, it is about love, not fear. 
And I'll just finish on uh, John 13, 34. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Amen. I'll just say a prayer. Father, we just thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, we just pray. Lord, in what's been said this morning, that we will take the truth and take what's from you and leave the rest, Lord. Uh, Father, I got... I just pray for that freedom in each one of us, Lord, for in our lives, in our workplace, in our homes, in our street, in our college, wherever we are, Lord, that we will just have that sense of your presence, Lord, uh, at all times. And Lord, that that naturalness of your love will, f will flow through each one of us. Lord, and knowing your presence, Lord, uh, living in an abundant life that you uh, have planned for each one of us and living our lives based on love not of fear. Lord, we thank you that your way is a different way. It's not the world's way. It is a way of abundance and the way of love. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. It took me two and a half years to get him to stand up and say that. So, so. Good stuff. Thank you, Stu. Would you stand with me? We'll sing a final song, but I, I, I just want to say this. There is uh, always a place in church if you come in feeling empty for you to get ministry. And uh, that scripture is very, very poignant about sometimes you clear stuff out and yet don't get filled with God again. And God's been speaking to me so clearly over these last couple of weeks about me imparting more to many of you. And uh, we're always here to help and to encourage you. So please make sure you take advantage of the means of grace. You know that we have services, the Bible is taught, we pray. Get yourself along to some of this stuff and get... Filled with God, that God might work in us. Thanks, Stu. Take up our tithes and offerings as a singer. Final song. <clears throat> My life is in you, Lord. <laughs> too late to pick up the phone or send a text and invite somebody this evening. I was telling them on Thursday night I 
the privilege of getting into a room in Womburn with three undertakers and a director from Crow Funeral Care, and boy, did they get it. So, um, you know, th these opportunities are everywhere. And uh, you, God has spoken to me so profoundly just these last few days, and the thing he said to me more, more, more sharply than I think I've ever felt it before is that there are people, everybody everywhere, is just one God encounter away from salvation. And so, you know, we don't need the Holy Spirit tonight just to work on one thing Jay says or one thing that they hear during the singing or one prayer somebody utters. And they're in the kingdom of God. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus has got a wonderful way of saving people and meeting people. So your opportunity tonight, uh, be here and let's, uh, let's see God at work. Lord, we thank you again for what you've spoken to us this morning through the, through the service, through the ministry of the word, through Lord Jesus just being in your presence. Thank you for that, Lord. And we do pray for Stu and for Ruth, especially at this time when he's out canvassing and uh, just trying to secure again his position on the council. Lord, would you be with him and strengthen him? And Lord, for the upcoming uh, uh, election in our nation, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would just have your way, that this, co this country, again, would know what it is to be a Christian nation, and that, Father, there would be honour for your word, and there'd be honour for people, Lord Jesus, that it would not be a fear culture. Lord, we live in so much of a fear culture. Thank you that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Help your people, Lord Jesus, to do right and to do good. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and God bless you.